So let's get on to the topic of fields. We've been here for two hours. We can do half an hour more. Let's go. So what is a field? Well, a field is a 3D region of space, right? And when two fields interact, they apply a force on each other. How can we represent fields? Well, we represent fields using vectors, aka arrows. The shape of the field line shows the shape of the field. The closer the lines are, the stronger the, stronger the field is, and know that the lines can never touch. Now, when we are talking about the gravitational fields, some of the properties that you need to know is that there are going to be three types. Sorry, there are going to be three types of fields. I should have mentioned gravitational, electric, and magnetic. The properties are that there are only there are only attractive fields. A monopole has a one pole the, for gravitational fields. Uh, the shape is radial. The arrows point inwards, and the field is stronger near the mass. The formulas for gravitational field are G is equal to GM divided by R square or G multiplied by capital M multiplied by smaller M divided by R square. Now I'm going to explain what all of them explain what all of them mean. You have them on the bottom right hand side as well. Hmm. Okay, talking for two hours is not the best idea. So, let's take an example. Let's assume you are, let's, there's a satellite, let's assume this is Earth, and we have a satellite, let's say the Moon, alright? G represents the gravitational constant, universal gravitational constant is 6.67 multiplied by 10 to the power of negative 11. M is the mass of the Earth. R square is the radius. However, 90% of students make a mistake here. Big M is the mass of the Earth, mass of the larger body. Smaller M is mass of the smaller body, the moon. The radius, this is where students mess up all the time. It's from the center of the Earth to the center of the satellite. Alright? The radius of the Earth is from the center of the Earth to the surface of the Earth. And the altitude, the height... That which of which the satellite is above the Earth is called the altitude, right? So the radius that you put in as a denominator, the radius there is equal to the radius of the Earth plus the altitude. I can guarantee you about 70% of the state makes a mistake here. There are a lot of mistakes that students make. Again, this is just an overview. Like, this is a head start lecture. This is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more to it, right? But if you can avoid this, you're basically guaranteed onto a high score, right? Like, getting a high score. Because as you've seen so far, physics is pretty simple. Or you can make it even simpler if you do the right questions. And, yep. Satellite motion. Cool. Uh, when it comes to satellites, there's something called a geostationary satellite. A geostationary satellite is a satellite that has a period equal to the period of the Earth. That is, if it takes 24 hours for Earth to rotate around itself, the satellite also takes 24 hours to rotate around Earth. The reason we call it geostationary is because it's above the same point on Earth all the time. It's above the equator. And the rest about the parent weight and the parent weightlessness we, we cover. Here, what you're seeing here is essentially something called Kepler's law. And I can get into more details about this. There are some tricks that we, got. we don't have that much time. 
but there is a way that we got trick students and there are some good questions that you can do on past exams I can't remember which one it is off the top of my head I have a list somewhere of some of the questions but anyways um, I do remember uh, they try and trick you with Kepler's law so Kepler's law essentially is r cube on t square is equal to gm on 4 pi square right but there is certain ways that vika uses this uh the basic ones is you should know this formula and you should know the rearrangement s square cube of gm t square on 4 pi square and you should also know the rearrangement of t is equal to square root of um 4 pi square r cube divided by gm this is like the basics right you should know you should know this uh it comes from the fact that they are saying since we have the earth and the moon right as a satellite going around the earth this is where kepler's law came from right these are the formulas that you need to have on your cheat sheet for sure because it will come up on the exam but what i'm going to explain now is where did these formulas kind of came from right they came from the fact that we know that the weight force the formula that you saw before right the weight force we said is universal gravitational constant multiplied by mass of the earth multiplied by mass of the moon divided by the radius squared where the radius is altitude plus radius of the earth right or just the distance between the centers of the two bodies now this is the weight force but if the weight force that is acting on the moon by earth and on earth by the moon right the weight force now is not just g multiplied by m this is too basic right g is equal to g m on r right right we are extrapolating right we're going a bit deeper into it what g is so it's kind of getting deeper and deeper learning about physics more and more so far from year 11 you've only scratched the surface of what physics is right and you can go deeper into it now this is what weight force is and this is the weight force that earth applies on the moon and the force that the moon applies on earth but if you assume that the path that the moon follows around the earth its orbit it's not elliptical if you assume it is perfectly circular right you can see that the weight force now becomes a centripetal force so you can equate the weight force to m v square on r you can cancel out the mass of the moon right and you can come to the conclusion that the gravitational field strength is equal to a centripetal acceleration and then you break it down here you can follow the masses and you're left with you're left with this part which is basically Kepler's law here now obviously there are two types of energies associated with a satellite going around earth the most obvious one is gravitational potential energy and the other one is kinetic energy now keep in mind as a satellite let's say you shoot a rocket into space and then you, that rocket is coming back right like spacex as the rocket comes back it's losing gravitational potential energy but it's gaining kinetic energy now because we have a new formula for gravitational potential energy right because we said gravitational potential energy is mgh but g is now gm on r square because it's a function of distance you can't use this formula anymore right you don't need to know why you can't use it anymore i'm explaining it for those of you who are mathematically minded but you can't you can't use it anymore that's basically it. so you need to use, calculate the area under a graph and that's it it's pretty straightforward don't forget the units should be correct one again i've told you before the distance should be in meters and it should be forced in newtons if it's not force if it's g in newtons per kilogram you need to multiply it by the mass of the satellite now let's go on to electric fields
electric fields are radial just like gravitational fields the field is stronger towards the point charge they are monopoles and arrows point away from a positive charge but they point towards the negative charge there is a formula let's say this is the proton and then you have an electron orbiting around the proton just like gravitational field strength is equal to gm on r square the electric field strength is equal to kq multiplied by r square where q is the charge of the proton now if you multiply it by another q which is the charge of the electron if i had more time i could explain this better obviously but if it's the charge of the electron obviously you're gonna get the electric force applied right just like if you multiply this by the mass of the moon by the mass of the satellite you can get the weight force right so i'm drawing two parallels between um a gravitational fields and electric fields these parallels are like if the proton if the nucleus is the earth and if the satellite now is the electron instead of the moon right it's kind of the same thing you can see multiple parallels being drawn here what will be asked by you by vika right as you can see again the formula is very similar to what you saw before now what will be asked you guys by vika well one of the main things is to draw arrows correctly again they come out of the proton and they go into the electron out of the proton onto the electron if you have two like charges the magnetic fields they will cancel the electric fields they will cancel each other out right so be careful with that and field lines never cross each other now obviously there are external uh, electric fields internal electric fields all of that uh, there are other formulas associated with that section for example um, the electric field strength here is not what you saw before there's a new formula it's v divided by d um force is q multiplied by e and work is q multiplied by v obviously i could go into derivation of this in more detail but the thing is we don't have that much time and i can summarize it by saying we have radial fields and we have uh non-radial fields right in this case the field is non-radial that's why it gets the form that it gets we could potentially draw a parallel with gravitational field lines as well with gravitational fields but we don't have the time so let's go on to magnetic fields because magnetic fields are very important as well. And I want